Welcome everyone to the second part of our series. This is Green Farm, and we are adding our voice to Time for Nature. Today we are marking the World Environmental Day, 2020, 5th of June, and with me are panelists from Green Farm. First, to start us off, we we'll have a small game. So I'll ask, I'll ask Edith, um, if you were to if you were to pick an ecosystem and you were to carry only three things with you, what would you have? With you and which ecosystem would you pick? Well, uh, good question. I think I would pick a forest ecosystem. So I would carry a camera because I just find forest so beautiful. Uh, I would also carry food <laughs> because I love food. And then I am torn between whether I should carry a flashlight or a blanket. So if mm. I had four, those would be my four. Right, right. Um, Rukia, what would you? What are the three things you'd carry for your your ecosystem? Well, that's a that's a good question. Um, oof. I think I'll stick to forest as well. Uh, high likely chance of getting like quickly edible food. <laughs> um, so what I'll carry with me would be um, a tent. Mm -hmm. um, then I'll also carry water, just to be safe, or a bottle of water. Uh, what else would I carry, to be honest? Um... Oh no, a bag to just to help me forage <laughs> so I can collect all that stuff I'm collecting in the forest. Uh, but yeah, I, I hope I'll survive because I'm like really torn on what to carry. <laughs> so maybe I'll pass it over to Kaha. So, yeah. Kaha, what would you carry? The three things you'd carry in your ecosystem? Um, I'd prefer. A coastal marine ecosystem. I'd carry a knife. I don't know why this lady didn't say a knife. Where are you going without a knife? I'd carry a knife. I'd carry what else? A camera. Ah, that's important. And I don't know. I don't think I'd need anything else because I'll just find food wherever I can find. Yeah, just those two. Interesting. I'm, I know you guys want to hear what I will carry. So if you really want to hear that, I'll ask you to mute yourself because I want to give you like really bombshell <laughs> three things that I'm going to carry. Um, just that was a polite reminder. Even as we continue recording, we mute ourselves so that we are able to have a very swift conversation throughout the webinar. Thank you so much for that. So the three things I would carry. I thought of fire, like how I would light up a fire. Um, the other thing that I would carry would be um, your knife. I'm borrowed from Kaha, so I, don't, I didn't think of a knife, but I think I, I like that because it's inevitable. Depending on which ecosystem you, you go to, if it's the wild, wild nature, you'll have to kill a few things. Okay. Whoa, did I say that in public? No. <laughs> I didn't say that out loud. Forgive me, oh dear conservationists. But the other thing that I would want to carry is something at least to cover myself during the night. It gets it gets cold. So you're curious to know which ecosystem I would want I'll be in. Most likely in a forest. Though I'm not so happy with my choice because I'm like none of us has picked a desert. None of us picked a, a swampy area. <laughs> it's only Kahatu was brave enough to stay in the coastal marine. So are you gonna stay in an island or will you stay very close to the ocean or at the beach? I'm curious, but I think that's a story for another day. <laughs> So um, we'll just begin the webinar series. A small recap of what we discussed uh, in, the, in the part one, we were able to share our thoughts on the World Environmental Day and raising our voices for the World Environmental Day. We acknowledge that this, the space that we have right now is a digital space, and many of us can still take part in raising our voices for nature in the digital space by participating in various challenges you can also take up the challenge of being a plant parent, some, an idea that is well 
very millennial, but I think it's very important because it helps us to take up responsibility as a generation where we not only think about what else can we do to you know, further our education or our careers or to be better people, but imagine if you can say, I planted that tree, or if you can say that I'm taking care of that you know, conservancy or I'm taking care of this part of nature. So that was a little bit of our part one of the webinar series. So today, for, so not today, but at this moment in part two, we are going to shift a little bit of gear and focus more on the thematic areas. And the thematic areas for this webinar are food security, water management, and wildlife management. Lastly, we will also focus on environmental legislation. So to start us off, I'll invite Rukia to share a little bit on the, on the challenges we have faced so far when it comes to water management. You can speak on a global level or on a national level. Welcome, Rukia. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Um, it's, it's a very interesting question because um, water is a very vast uh, um, ecosystem plus resource at, at the same time. So the challenges within them as as they're as like vast as itself. You understand? Um, so I, maybe the main one would be if I look at it as a on the human kind of side would be access to water. So just living in places where um, <laughs> water isn't as easily accessible to everyone as people presume. Um, with, with, I'll give an example as to recently right now, like if you check the news uh, in Kenya right now, you um, miss the COVID-19 crisis. People are complaining how they haven't had water in their houses for around three weeks or three to four weeks. And people are complaining how how is the government assisting uh, that situation and how, how are they going to survive through this COVID-19 situation when they're being asked to wash your hands, but how can you wash your hands when you don't have water? Um, so that's on like the household's perspective, but then thinking around it also in just the, the overall environmental perspective where there's flooding because maybe rivers uh, have been like encroached by people putting houses in waterways were before and now Nature is fighting back and like causing floods all of, all across the region. Uh, case in point, the situation with the like Victoria uh, flooding and coming into household in Uganda and and some parts of Kenya as well. So this is something that's happening over all over all over Kenya and obviously across the globe with different parts. So I guess that will be my current view on what the challenges are, and maybe I'll pass it over to Edith to let me know what her thoughts are on this subject. And more. Thank you, Rukia, and thank you for the insights you have shared in water management and the challenges that are experienced in that sector. My sector is food security, and uh, despite food being essential services, uh, the challenges that have been seen in this sector, you know, are so many, and the gaps are just increasing by the day. So. Maybe the main challenge that uh, we face in the food security sector is inadequate production of food. There are, you know, inadequate production that cannot seem to uh, satisfy the needs of an increasing population. Uh, so that plays out in very many different ways in different um, you know, nations or in different regions. Uh, for example, here in Kenya, it presents itself as um, an inadequate population of farmers, whereby we see that most of our farmers are of the um, older generation, if you want to say young at heart. There the are statistics that have shown that the average age of a farmer in Kenya is 63 years old. So we, do, we really do not have you know, the younger population taking up these farming opportunities. Um, so that means, therefore, that there's really no generation of farmers or food growers to replace the older generations. Um, so that is a challenge. The other challenge that is common uh, in many countries that have a high rate of food insecurity is that they over-rely over on food imports. So when the prices of food or of imports change, uh, you know, because they are highly volatile uh, based on the economic situation of the whole world. So that also uh, brings a challenge to something as paramount as food. Um, 
the other issue here in Kenya is that a huge population, a, a huge section of our land is uh, asal to mean arid and semi-arid land. So uh, we really need to rethink land use. Uh, is there a way that we can probably grow drought resistant crops uh, so that you know we are able to provide food or we are able to use the section of land that we have? Um, of course, the other challenge is that uh, agriculture has been super hit by climate change, which you know has been referred to as a crisis or an epidemic or something that is incurable or here to stay with us. So that is also one of the really major challenges. So of course, there's uh, a shift in our climate patterns, and therefore we you know require a little more research and a, a little more guidance on moving forward because then that uh, also affects food security. I'm curious to see what uh, Kahaso thinks about her sector. Thank you, Edith. So I'll be talking about the wildlife sector. And one of the challenges that has been there for a long time is for, for poaching, sorry, not pollution, poaching and wildlife tra trafficking. So um, let me even just go down to my local area. There's an there's a animal called elephant shrew. And locally, it's known as fugu. And if you ask anyone what meat they'd rather eat, it's that, it's that animal. And it has currently been categorized as endangered. And if you tell someone that it's not wise to, to they wouldn't, it's, it's their norm, it's what they used to do. So it's really hard for them to, to listen and understand your point of view. So that's one of the challenges that, that uh, wildlife are experiencing. Becky, to you. Thank you so much, Kahaso, for sharing. Of course, a very, uh, you know, I think it's almost like a very personal challenge that you're facing as a community when it comes to wildlife management. And just to bring the conversation back on the table, because you have raised different thematic areas. You have had Rukia talking about water management and how it's such a challenge, even in the in the wake of you know COVID-19. Imagine households are not able to have drinking water. Uh, households are still have still have to spend a lot of money on water, and yet water is very essential in terms of improving the hygiene, you know, the hygiene, hygiene conditions in our homes, in our hospitals, in our working spaces. And just even bringing on board, uh, Edith has highlighted a few not, uh, points on food security and how it's, the landscape looks for us as a country. And uh, sadly, with this lockdown, so many countries are on lockdown right now. You can imagine a particular food that is considered to be a staple can no longer be brought into the country as before. For our country, I think it's maize. And we, uh, we always hear the news for the news and of course from our farmers, sometimes we do not have, we have a deficit and we are forced to have imports. In instances, sometimes we have a surplus and because of our storage conditions, we're not able you know, to store. So these are very you know, critical areas uh, when it comes to you know, critical areas that touch, in, uh, you know, touch on us as a community, touch on us as people who are custodians of the environment. And of course, you see how it's very tied into how we conserve and how we protect the environment. Because if we were able to protect and conserve the environment as we should, then we'll be able to use the resources sustainably in a manner that we're not only benefiting right now or trying to adapt. Because the reality, as Edith mentioned, I think Yolanda talked about climate change, some of these things are inevitable. The reality is things are changing. We can no longer do business as usual as usual, the people who were known to be you know, the livelihoods or their pastoralists or farmers, and you find that maybe the younger generation is interested in taking up different career paths or you know, different livelihoods. So those are the realities that we are facing. And why I have talked about this uh, particularly is because my area of interest is on environmental legis legislation. And I believe this and environmental legislation actually brings all these experts on board. 
thirdly, as a country, what I, I have observed is that for a long time, okay, not really, it, it has changed. In the 1970s, we had over 77 sectoral laws which talked or touched on the environment. And even when we still had the MCA 1999 brought on board, there were still, of course, overriding interests and overriding you know, issues that came with that came and it was kind of hard. Though we have MCA harmonizing the environmental management in our country, we still would have you know, conflicts across the sectors or other conflicts when it comes to inter the interpretation on, of uh, environmental legislation in Kenya. So those, I, I would say that is one of the challenges we are still facing. Yes, we appreciate we have a constitution right now that has you know, embodied environmental right as a human right for every Kenyan citizen to live in a clean and healthy environment. And you know, right now, it's, that is 2010, 10 years from now, we're still seeing people who are you know, not living in safe spaces. And safe spaces, not only in security terms, but if you're not water secure, if you're not food secure, then I would say you're not living in a safe space. If you're not, uh, you know, we still have uh, stories of human wildlife environment, then that means you're not living in a safe and clean environment. And I believe when legislators and you know, policy makers, experts, the communities, people are able to participate and add their voice to the different, you know, the different uh, policies we have, then we will probably change the traje trajectory in regards to you know, environmental management. If not change it, at least see the best way to accommodate everyone. And of course, the goal at the end of the day is to ensure that there is harmonization and we're able to make a very beautiful dance between the people and the planet and of course, and our nature. So I will bring, just to shift the gear as the moderator of this webinar, I'd like to hear from Rukia. I know we have talked about challenges right now that we are facing in our sector. Maybe you can give us a little bit of hope. What are the opportunities that we have when it comes to water management? I know that you know, success stories in different areas, if you have any, and then we'll just have that running even throughout the webinar. Um, thank you, Rebecca. I guess today I'm the one who's on sport, I guess. <laughs> um, so in every challenge, there's always an opportunity. That's something that I'm always keen to like think about in my life. Like there's no way that one thing doesn't have a solution. So I'll just point out to a few uh, that I've thought of, I have in mind and um, I give a case study of uh, areas like Malindi, like Shimoni. Um, uh, there are people who uh, have that is uh, I don't know what what to call those contraptions they have, but they have this section. They have a model uh, of rainwater harvesting that they use, where you build you build a structure that looks like a house, uh, but there's a mesh. So it's like an underwater underground tank. So there's a mesh on top. So when it rains that it goes directly to the underground and you have like a basement full of water that helps you provide water just not for you uh, as the person who lives in Malindi or the person who owns that space but even community members who want to use that water so rainwater harvesting has been a good opportunity in terms of getting like building access to water and similarly the same same rainwater harvesting techniques have helped a lot in terms of curbing flooding situations uh, since most times there's flooding because the water doesn't know where to go. Either there's poor drainage or uh, no one's harvesting all that water that's coming from the sky and more. So rainwater harvesting is both a solution to an, or an opportunity to, um, to just access, like to improving the access to water situation in a space or county or area, but also preventing uh, just the devastating, um, what is the word for this? Uh, impacts of flooding that come through to that as and this is just me touching on to the challenges that I spoke out on before uh, also there's also an opportunity for education um, I think there's a lot of knowledge that is circulating all across the region not only just in Kenya but also globally uh, taking taking like uh, case studies and insights from countries and regions that have experienced either flooding or poor access to water situations like for example in Cape Town They've been struggling with accessing water for the longest time. We, we can look into what are these guys in Cape Town doing to make sure that they are, they are, there's, there's water in the households. I have a colleague of mine who's based in Cape Town and what they do is um, they make sure that they don't shower just because they have to shower. 
but in terms of like making sure you you conserve the usual amount of water you have in your household uh, you know there are those people some of us who are, have the worst habits you shower morning afternoon evening um and maybe you're just in the house Especially now during COVID-19, where are you seriously? Where are you going right now that you need to shower three times a day? So those little things like uh, just like conserving water in your household, do what you have would mean would mean that there's more water to go around or throughout the community, and just taking those few uh, steps to rainwater harvest, putting a simple like bucket outside when it's raining is a nice way to just ensure that you have more access. And finally, I guess the option that we all go to is the government improving the services to the communities uh, and giving more business to people who have, uh, like their main area of business is providing water to communities. So that would be a nice way for the government to subsidize that and ensure communities have good access to water and yeah, and more. Uh, and then I guess I'll pass it over to uh, Edith for just more insights on her sector and the opportunities there. Thank you so much, Rukia. Whoever thought uh, bathing a lot of times in a day would be classified as bad habits. Thank you so much uh, for a very interesting uh, outlook on water management and how we can do better. You know, even even as humans. Um, so in my in my sector, food security, there has been a lot of progress. To be honest, um, you know, including research that has been carried out towards growing green, you know, more like um, an input in sustainable agriculture, whereby, you know, just ensuring the efficient use of resources, whether these resources are soil, whether these resources are water, you know, are we using water efficiently, even as we uh, grow the food? Um, also, uh, the other way is to minimize the pollution of the air, the water, and the, you know, generally the climate in where we are planting. And this is a whole subject on its own. It's called uh, agroecology. Uh, there's also a lot of research on the different systems that, you know, can be used apart from just growing normally. Uh, we have, you know, growing with hydroponics. There's also aeroponics. These are some of the sustainable practices that can be used uh, to ensure that we are growing more and more food. There's also, um, in terms of opportunity, there's, uh, of course, there's a huge opportunity to feed, uh, you know, the 7.7 .7 of us that are in this world. But uh, I would like to point out the opportunity in urban agriculture. Uh, it has been projected that by 2050, we'll have about 68% to 70% of the world living in urban cities or urban areas. So it's an opportunity for the people who are going to be living in cities to be able to grow their own food. Uh, so it, you know, it, it begs us, you know, it begs the question, how are we able to grow our own food, whether it's in balconies of the, you know, flats and apartments where we live, you know, whether it is just starting with small hubs where you are and, you know, trying to increase that as we go, or how are we pre preserving seed if we buy organic food? Um, the other opportunity and that, I have sort of introduced it is organic agriculture. There is a lot of emphasis currently on uh, eating clean eating. It's sort of a millennial trend. Uh, we want to eat clean. We want to eat organic. We want to try and avoid, um, you know, GMO, which is a whole different discussion or conversation that I do not want to get into. But basically, you know, food security is not just you know production of food because this food. It's, it's, it's about um, people having um, access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food, which meets their dietary needs. So basically it's about exploring, you know, what is fit for the diets of people in which type of, you know, area or in which population. So basically it provides an opportunity for organic agriculture because most of the times the solution is green. Um, there's also the opportunity uh, in the transport sector to ensure that people have access to food uh, because a lot of food is wasted in post-harvest losses. You know, harvest that does not get to markets, harvest that does not get to our tables, 
but yet it is you know wasted by it goes bad basically so there's the opportunity of increasing um access to food from the you know from farm to table how can we lessen that distance from from the farm to the table how can we ensure that you know food does not go bad in terms of post harvest losses so those are the ones that i can think about on the top of my head but absolutely uh, a huge opportunity for research uh, for food systems that work you know a food system that would work for example in kenya that would not necessarily work if transported to a different um, area or region so based upon the you know the places where the people are at can we have a little more research what is sustainable in the places where they are yeah thank you so much becky thank you so much uh, ladies for sharing some of the opportunities that you have observed when it comes to the different thematic areas i think this is something that uh, you know as environmentalists and not only environmentalists as people who are concerned about the environment when we are able to identify a particular thematic area we're able to observe you know we are listening to what other people are saying what are the farmers talking about what about those who are you know who may not necessarily be experts but actually need that good those people who need that service or water services how can we ensure that we are speaking the same language and we are actually coming to an understanding of all that so for 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 that i think we still you see how all these sectors are still tied in i think it's amazing how we in this panel we still you know we can still see like yeah yes we want uh, water security but at the same time if there's water security and there's no food security then you know our efforts are null and void yes i want to talk about for example i am passionate about environmental legislation if i speak about environmental legislation it cannot op you know it cannot occur in a vacuum i still have to hear the voices of other people people who are passionate about wildlife management they need to still have a seat at the table and be able to bring their voice into that policy that i'm trying to draft or to bring on board in terms of you know whether it's a development project whether it's a project that touches on food security that way we'll have less conflicts and more of you know progress when it comes to you know environmental management and good practices in the different thematic areas so i would like to call on uh, kahaso maybe she can share with us some opportunities i know right now she's uh, off video but uh, thankfully we still on zoom we still have the audio uh, you know the opportunity to have audio and she can share with us the opportunities that are there in the wildlife sector thank you becky these are some of the negative impact of covid some of us were shipped to the shamba where there are no lights so you'll forgive me about the video option so some of the some of the opportunities is empowering the community like once we involve the community in the activities that we are trying to do uh, conserving i mean protecting the wildlife and all that we are able to help them understand more and and help them find different ways of of uh, getting i mean of different ways of understanding what we are trying to to put out there so i think that's one of the ways that we can help as me as i mean me focusing on wildlife the wildlife sector we can help improve and reduce the poaching the uh, the poaching and all that so yeah i think that's all i have for now thank you so much kahaso um I, I i believe that this is just the beginning for us in this webinar series because even through our conversation i think there are a few things items we were not able to expound on because of time of course and the other thing is some of them are a pandora box you've talked about poaching and people have different views on poaching and game hunting even if you had mentioned something about gmos i know there's a big debate on gmos and organic and it almost seems like it's, you're either going organic or you're going gmos and it's, there's no middle ground when we get to the water sector people have commercialized water sector something that is supposed to be a free public good and you see it's it, is it just to you know you talk about justice and we're talking about uh, equal access 
to natural resources. If we are making commodities that are supposed to be free, something that we charge, then you see it's, it becomes a problem to all of us. So as we mark the end of the webinar, I believe I was also able to touch on a few things while coming to environmental legislation. So I'll not expound on that so that you're able to join us in our next webinar series where we will be able to talk more on different thematic areas, these particular ones on food security, water management, wildlife management, we'll be able to expound that more. And of course, if you have any suggestions for us in the next webinar series, we are open to have such from uh, our, you know, our audiences in the different social media platforms. Thank you very much for tuning in, if you've tuned in. And uh, thank you very much, dear panelists, for adding your voice to the World Environmental Day. Well, um, uh, lots of love from the Green Farm team and uh, God bless you all. Bye. Bye.